Hey, nice to meet you guys. I'm Luis Jeffes. Um, just going to tell you just a little bit about what the talk is going to be about. It's not like a tutorial. It's not like a, it's a little bit of best practices and everything. But this is mostly about like my experience in the game industry throughout like I've been in it for like about 12 years um, and how that's every project and stuff has shaped the way I work, my processes, the way I interact with other disciplines and stuff. Main objective is I'm a I was just talking about this earlier, and I can't find the right words, so I'm going to use crusade, because that seemed fitting from earlier. Um, I'm going to crusade for just tearing down walls that exist between different disciplines in, in the studio. Um, you know, they talk about bridging, uh, building bridges. I don't want bridges to exist. I kind of want the continents to just, like, come together. Um, all right, how many, just to get, get a gauge, how many here are industry uh, professionals or are working in the industry? Um, Okay, pretty good. Others just students or interested in it. So uh, for the, those of you that uh, are working with in studios or in this kind of work, you understand like there are disciplines and there are you know roles within each one of those disciplines, responsibilities that fall. My experience has just been that anytime you can mix those and they are working together, you always get a much better result. And so I'm trying to just this, this talk is about trying to break that and uh, showcasing how that stuff will better your product your product in the end. So. Let's just uh, get started. Quick disclaimer, these are my lessons and experiences. This is what I've gone through, the thing that I think you should be thinking about or processing. Um, the tips and philosophies of every single person that I have worked on, by no means are the things that I'm gonna talk about here my own findings. Most of these are just things that I've learned from much, much smarter people than myself and I've just accommodated into my workflow. Um, your mileage is going to vary depending on your experiences and the kind of projects and stuff that you're working on. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, a little bit of a background, I'm originally from Cancun, Mexico City. Uh, I studied at the Art Institute of Phoenix. I started uh, game design um, and art. I've been doing art professionally for about 16 years, 12 of them in the game industry. And I have done everything from render farm watching to effects to doing like CG for commercials, movies, I've done animations, props, environments, uh, system designs, UX, UI, and I've been a lead level, uh, artist and a level designer artist. So I have worked on everything from VR to mobile, some console, uh, PC, and film. So I'm a little bit all over the place, which is why I think my experiences kind of like show uh, what I'm going to be talking about, how all these things just correlate to one another. Uh, just some of the stuff that I've worked on, uh, at least the stuff that has seen the light of day. Um, what the bleep, because uh, I've worked on way more than this, but not everything has seen the light of day. Uh, agency, I guess that didn't see the light of day, but uh, uh, DC Universe, uh, Hybrid, um, the Friends Group 2 VR edition, uh, Brass Tactics, uh, and recently we just released uh, State of Decay 2. So that's a little bit of my uh, portfolio. So we're going to talk a little bit about disciplines and role separation. What, particularly for this talk, is going to be all about uh, environment artists and level designers for the most part, how they correlate. But I can't talk about environment artists without addressing prop artists in that category as well. So let's see, prop artists and environment artists. What, what are each one of them? People say tomato, tomato. Um, if you look at uh, a lot of disciplines in your personal work experience probably, they kind of, when you say a prop artist, you think of the same person that's building the levels as well. Um, it's a very easy mistake to do, but it's not. These are completely separate people. It's like saying a character artist and a prop artist, right? Like, uh, th that's how different they are. The main difference between these two is an environment artist must sell the world and make the experience immersive at face value. That means that you have to believe the setting that you're in, if you're in a fantasy world, if you're in a realistic like GTA game, stuff like that, like just at face value without playing the game, any of the audio cues or anything like that, that visuals have to immerse you and believe that you're inside of that world. That's the main job that the environment artist is giving you at face value. The environment artists also have to always be on top of the visibility, what you can see, what you cannot see, which is just as important. Uh, polygon counts on the scene on assets, uh, instance count, memory usage, streaming, lighting, how you're guiding the player with all of these things. Um, 
the reason that environment artists are always in charge of this is because anytime that performance tanks so there's are there are issues nine out of ten times art is going to be the first department that programming or QA or somebody will go ping it's like hey the level is running uh, can I curse I, I curse a lot yes. so, uh, I'm gonna try and keep it down but I'm not sure. uh, this is an over 21 audience. <laughs> well, I don't, uh, so I'm going to try to keep it down, but I, I, I curse a lot of my everyday. So I'm trying to keep it down, but just know. Uh, it, in my experience, it's always been like anytime performance hits, there's a problem, not, things are chugging or not quite working. Who are the first people to get paint? It's usually environment artists, actually. Uh, it's like, hey, you put too, much, too many assets in here, you put in too many textures and stuff like that. That is actually awesome and terrible at the same time because it's made me really good at understanding how games run. It's made me um, like go in under the hood and start to take a look. So you, you start looking at you know how much uh, polygons are we rendering? What is maybe the heaviest asset that you're loading into the scene? So if an environment artist doesn't have that kind of like technical background in there or like that knowledge of how to dig into that stuff, they're going to be suffering a lot, and then you're going to end up a lot of time trying to fix things or redo work that you may not necessarily do because it might be something in the code that's actually causing. This, but being able to dig in and you know promote those issues, um, so this is uh, something I really enjoy about environment art. It's made me understand a lot more about how games work, how they get made, because I'm usually pinged first about like just stuff not working correctly. Um, so let's take a look at the difference between a prop and environment. Art. So when you think of, when you say prop artists, things like this come into mind, right? Single standalone assets, whether they're tiny from a cup all the way to a warehouse or a forklift, a weapon, stuff like that. These are kind of self-contained assets that help um, either populate the world, drive some kind of mechanic, or anything of that sort. An environment artist is pretty much making the world itself uh, believable, right? So they're taking most of the, what a prop artist does, putting it together in a layout, uh, playing around with lighting and stuff like that, and then making you understand that this is a real living world it exists in this own reality, and it's mimicking. It's playing by its own rules. So, a really good prop artist can probably bang out something like uh, these assets here, the warehouse stuff, and everything like that, make them really, really detailed. But when it comes to say, make an entire industrial level, they might not have that, um, not the, not the ability to do it, but they might not be able to comprehend the high level of how the player traverses through that, right? A prop artist is not thinking necessarily about how you move through the area, think of a Call of Duty game or stuff like that, like you enter a room, you have several exits at each point as you're playing it. An environment artist, a level artist is, uh, a level designer, sorry, is thinking about that stuff, whereas the prop artist is thinking about like, am I selling the wear and tear of the world? Am I, you know, making this uh, asset shine, making the graphics of the, of the game itself? be as polished as they can be and as like um, intriguing to consumers. So in my personal philosophy is that any, um, any environment artist can be a prop artist, but not all prop artists can be environment artists. Is that kind of clear? It's, 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 a, it's just a little bit, you have a lot of the same skill sets, you use a lot of the same uh, programs, you're modeling, you're UVing, you're texturing, you're using all these same tool sets but the scale at which you are uh, tackling the problems is a much, much different. So, level designers, first of all, who are they, what do they want? Um, let's talk about what they are not first. They're not like some like an ominous presence, people that are you know out to make your level uh, look worse because they want it to run, or, or I made this box and this angle fit in this particular place, so you must adhere all your art to it. Um, I've worked with a lot of designers that are very strict in that manner, the others that are very, very loose. At the end of the day, what I have found is that they're ultimately creative people. They're at a little bit of a different level than environment artists, but they have a lot of that background that uh, it takes environment artists to create those worlds. So level, level designers, they have to be Compared to an environment artist, a level designer has to be intimately familiar with the core gameplay loop. Um, they use it to push the player forward in the experience, so they need to understand what the ma main mechanic of the game is, whether you're shooting, whether you're jumping and platforming and stuff like that. They're thinking about what does the player see, where do they need to go, is it clear enough, is their objective um, clear? 
Um, they have a, a certain level of technical understanding and skill. So you'll see a lot of this where you know level designers actually can go in and script encounters and stuff. So they don't just take the visuals and the layout of what they're making. They're also utilizing a lot of the systems that the rest of the disciplines are creating, whether it's combat, uh, they're on top of streaming and things like that. They're kind of jig, uh, jigsaw puzzling it all together to drive that experience. Um, an artistic eye isn't necessary, but it uh, helps problem, solve problems early on. So there are some level designers that are very, very good at like just the technical side of it. They can think about how a player enters a space, how they encounter the the friction or the problem they encounter in that space, how it's going to be presented to them and how they resolve it, right? How they move forward. That's actually like really well. You want that at the core of a level designer. And they might not really know uh, red from green or anything like that. That's completely okay. But if they can understand that and utilize it to, if they can put that in their tool set and use those things to try to establish the pacing, the look, the feel of the game, then your level is going to be at a much, much better place earlier on than later. So the environment artists and the prop artists don't suddenly get handed off to them like this gray box. That makes no sense. They're like, this is supposed to be a casino. And you start looking at how the layout is. You're like, this is a, a corridor. This is like a hallway. And a casino is like this open, massive uh, space where you can just like traverse anywhere. So what you're giving me is not necessarily correlating to what we're trying to sell fantasy-wise, right? That's where that role, the environment artists that I was talking about, they're trying to sell the experience. Um, that's where they come in. So if you can start rolling what an environment artist does into a level designer early on without giving them the responsibility of making the level look good, guess what? By the time that level is done, it's just going to be that much further along into being able to go in and just start making it look pretty and you know make it all the way to shipping. Uh, so, level designers uh, provide the structure and they help establish pacing for, the mo for a specific moment in the game. They leverage the systems, combat, art, etc. to deliver an experience that aligns with, their vi with the vision of the game. The vision of the game is super important. You have to take every single one of the levels and experiences. It's just a piece of the puzzle, like I was saying. So it needs to play into the long term. If it's a, uh, if it's a military game, you know, you're shooting, you're doing that stuff. If it's a survivalist game, Again, this is just reiterating a little bit of what I have said, so it just has to play into the end goal of this thing. So mechanics are at the heart of a game, the game experience. Everything else, audio, story, art, systems, UI, hardware, and everything else is a delivery method. So uh, designers, environment artists, and stuff, if they're working together, you can take a look at like what you're trying to achieve. Is, is this particular level an area where the player is now presented with an upgrade uh, to their arsenal. Can they now grapple hook their way around the level and stuff like that? So you try to take, they're not responsible for generating those systems and somebody else is making them, handing them off to them, giving them certain rules. And the job of the level designer and the environment artist is to try to see how they can make it all work together and push that story forward. Um, the gameplay itself supports the story and the experience. So it has to be in tandem with it. You can see this a lot with uh, games like Devil May Cry and stuff, where the main core loop is like the combat, right? Presented with a wave of enemies, your whole uh, objective is to clear the enemies and move on to the next area, explore, keep going. How you do that is completely within the arsenal of what designers are given, which in this case is a lot of combat, uh, different ways of comboing that together, making the player feel empowered and you know challenged in that particular level. And, you should be stringing them along with this core gameplay loop. You're not going to move suddenly to the next uh, area and now it's going to be some kind of casino game, right? You have to keep bringing that string along with the same theme. So level, these two together, level design and environment art, are a runway for the experience to present itself. You are the scaffolding, you are pretty much the body of um, what it takes to present all these things to the player. You're, you're the delivery method between the team and the player. You're going to allow this to feel smooth and to be presented in a way that it's enjoyable, it's clear, the player knows what to do, and they can just keep moving forward. So you, you, uh, sorry. you have to evolve it and make it challenging and grounded and immersive. That's where the environment art kind of role kind of like falls into this. So 
taking a look at some examples you have here, like the Deus Ex thing. Um, this is obviously very early on in the game where you ha they have a couple of assets that are somewhat arted. The character is obviously, you know, pretty far along. You have the environment here. Now, if you take a look at it, you can see that it is some sort of hallway or broom where the player is going to enter and they have, uh, they have an objective here. They have to either bypass that um, guard or they have to take him out. They have to traverse through the area. Now, with this, uh, in this stage of the process, is what would be called kind of like a gray box or early design. You're not necessarily sure what this environment is. You're not sure if it's an office. You're not sure if it's a casino. Um, it's, it, that is unclear. It's a very, very vague, but it's a, it, gives a, it gives designers and the team an opportunity to start exploring how the players are going to traverse through the space, how they're going to encounter it and stuff. And then you have other ones like this Half-Life, uh, uh, what do they call it? I think they call it orange, this orange boxing or something like that because they use orange textures. Um, where you can tell this is some sort of either like a prison or it's a sort of industrial area. You can tell that those are railings. Not necessarily sure if they're wooden or they're metal. Um, you know, those are structures that you can go into. So this is a way to block that out. And this has a little bit more of an artistic eye to it already. So you can see that you're starting to solve issues here that you're not necessarily solving in the previous one where it's just a gray box, a cube, um, you're not really sure it could turn into anything, but you're not selling that right away. Another approach, and this is from uh, Uncharted 4, the, another approach is to gray box and block in a lot of these things, sell the idea of the environment, um, so you know exactly that this is an outdoor environment, there's some kind of like jungle or cliff, some bridges, uh, some waterfalls and stuff like that, but nothing in here is polished yet so everything is in place to sell the, the the theme of the level what the players actually able to see what they cannot see where they might be going and stuff so going here is the the cheapest way possible and the other thing that I'll be talking a little bit about later is the color coding so you can kind of see you can easily tell that what stuff is vegetation what stuff is structure uh, structures and what stuff is cliffs and if you go back to these you can see it's, it's hard to tell you don't know what the material properties are what necessarily those might be, right? So even this one, this one gets even more ambiguous at that level. So uh, I like these three screenshots because they showcase the different levels. I personally like working in this last one where you're kind of color coding as much as you can to also help start getting a color palette in so that you know that the level is hitting the right mood that the art director wants for the for the game, the things that need to be legible. Like here you can clearly know, you clearly can tell that you're supposed to traverse the structure itself, everything else. Uh, it's not necessarily calling like a pathway for the player or anything, and there's nothing um, polish or texture-wise here that is, you know, or UI even that's telling you that you can just inherit all that information from seeing the visual blocks and the colors. So none of this can be uh, achieved at all if you don't have these three things in place, and I'm a big, big proponent of them: the camera, the character, and the controls. These need to be in place, not final. Um, I want to be very clear about that. Um, they need to be in place so that you can start evolving like what the players can see, how they're gonna move, if the move the character movement feels correct. Are you going if you is your input on the controller, is it on the keyboard? Is it in VR with the touch controls, right? Like all think about all these things has such a huge impact into the kind of experience that the player is gonna have. But you need to understand them, you need to spend a lot of time in here. You don't want to start building the entire game unless you have these. So let's talk a little bit about each one. Camera is pretty much the way that you're presenting the player, uh, the player information to, I'm sorry, the character's information to the player. Is it a third person view? Is it a first person view? Um, if it's a first person view, then you know you have a lot higher fidelity. Your uh, first of what you can see, it's a lot shorter. You can't see as much to the sides as you would be able to in a third person, which is why you see games that are heavy on combat, um, like melee combat and stuff, use more of a third person camera, like. Batman Arkham Asylum and those kind of games like State of Decay, for example, we use that quite a bit because you want to be aware of your surroundings. That's a big design pillar in it, right? Be aware of the surroundings. A first-person camera, you are aware of that stuff, but not to the extent that a third-person camera allows you. Um, character. What is what is your character? What does the character do? Um, I love Overwatch, uh, as I'm sure many of you guys here do, because they do a really good job here. The camera is pretty much the same with all these guys, but they all play very differently. Every single one of these characters visually is unique from each other, and they feel and play differently, right? So Diva is going to move a lot different than Sonya. Um, is it Sonya? 
Uh, yeah, uh, or the, the music, I forget their names. Torbjorn is one of my favorite guys and stuff, but if you can t take a look at that game, it's the exact same camera, right? The camera does not change uh, between the characters. The character does, and what they do, how they move through the level, and stuff like that changes entirely once you know what the character is supposed to do. So understanding that is insanely important. You can be a platformer, so Lucky's uh, Tale, you know that you're the squirrel, you can jump, you can kind of glide and stuff like that. Instead of decay, it would be weird to have one of these characters, for example, be there where it's a realistic sort of Bibleist game. So we know that you're a human being, so what can human beings do? Um, what are their limits? What, are the, what is the player expectation that these people would be able to accomplish in a gameplay scenario? So once you kind of have that, then you can understand what you're going to be achieving and where you're heading into. And control. Um, you want to <laughs> you want to make it as uh, straightforward as possible. Understand what your input mechanism is. Nowadays, it's a lot of a uh, keyboard and mouse, um, keyboard, mouse, and gamepad. So like an Xbox controller and stuff. That's kind of very common nowadays to support both, but they're very different um, input methods. So you want to keep the keyboard and PC players in mind with how can I sprint? How can I crouch? Like you don't want to make it uncomfortable on the fingers and stuff. Whereas with a controller, it's a lot more comfortable, but you're a lot more limited. So it's like, if that is going to be one of the main things that you're supporting, you have to design the mechanics and everything around to take advantage of either comboing the controls um, and moving that stuff. So you have to have these things in place um, in order to start advancing the level design itself. Because if those things change, it can have a dramatic effect on the way you design the level. Designing a level for a third-person camera and for a first-person is going to be completely different. I was just watching this thing for Fortnite where people are playing with the ultra, I forget what they're called, ultra wide uh, monitors now. So people are playing competitive. They're buying the ultra wide monitors because it actually gives them about a 20% more real estate on the camera to see versus normal people um, that have like a, you know, the just normal ratio uh, control. So it actually gives you a competitive edge towards that. And that's, a, in my opinion, something that like just greatly breaks the the fairness on a competitive game, for example. So you want to keep those things in mind. So we talk, want to talk a little bit about like um, the road to making a good level. And these are just a couple tips and just processes that I've uh, been able to, to take and try out. Um, both design and art need to pursue immersion. It goes a little bit back to what I was saying, trying to like find the theme of what you're building, if it's a jungle game, if it's a jungle level, if it's an industrial level, whatever it is. Trying to figure out how art can better inform design decisions, being able to clearly tell ledges, what's interactable, uh, window openings, pathways, and stuff like that um, to each other so that it just feels like a real place. So a good way to go about that is to actually let, uh, if you're in a purely level designer slash environment artist kind of like scenario uh, uh, studio, is to let the level designer take a stab at it first, let them go through the, through the gray box, but don't let it go beyond like a week before you involve the environment artists on it because they're going to start being able to like tell you like, oh, well, these are the issues because of the theme that we're pursuing because of all this, this, and that, right? Um, functions and goals need to be clear. So both the environment artist and the level designer need to understand. So if in this level your whole objective is to reach the red door through platforming, that needs to be crystal clear without very minimal um, UI, voiceover, all those extra tools that are just going to enhance the clarity of your messaging. You just need to make that clear. So the minute you enter through the room, you need to make sure that what you can see is your objective, or at least that it's starting to guide your eye towards that. And that's stuff that the environment artist can help the level designers uh, do, right? So you can start putting scaffolding that creates lines that start just creating some somewhat of a visual flow towards a certain point without necessarily putting a big arrow uh, that says, go here. Um, you need to make the experience uh, smooth. Plan on iterating and failing a lot. So I jump ahead just th these two here really quickly because one of my biggest pet peeves here is uh, collision. So now for those of you that might not know, collision is pretty much like the invisible geometry or uh, borders that prevent you from falling through the world, walking through a wall and stuff like that. Naughty Dog, for example, uh, I'm sorry, not Naughty Dog. I know uh, Sucker Punch, I know uh, for Infamous 2, they had people that worked on the level itself, so the, the big uh, beautiful cities. They made them as good as they could, and then they had somebody else entirely working on the collision geometry, so that as you're traversing through it, um, it was as smooth as possible. So you might have 
a floor that looks kind of uh, crumbled and has pebbles and stuff like that, but you're not necessarily interacting with those pebbles. It's like a flat plane that's invisible through it so that you can just move smoothly because that game is all about traversal, uh, you know, quick kind of parkouring around the, the world. So you don't want to get snagged. And a lot of the times, that collision and stuff will make the player get snagged, uh, get caught around a corner, feel like they're not quite in control, um, more underlying control because it goes back to the camera character controls, right? Making that feel really, really smooth. So you want to spend a lot of time making sure that the player's not getting snagged on things that they can't quite control or tell. Um, and even after a lot of uh, iteration and planning, your level might not be there. It might not feel fun. It might not be communicated correctly what you want them to do. Um, players might be dying a lot in a, in a specific part of the level. So this goes uh, back on plan on iterating and failing a lot. So don't expect that you're going to start working on a level and you're going to be done in about a week. That your first try is going to be, that's going to be golden. Now I just need to polish it and just like smooth out some rough edges and stuff like that. I usually, if time allows, I usually like to grab a level, build it up with uh, the kind of like the color coding that I was that I showed before, and then throw it away, like throw it away and try to build it again. Because the amount of time that it took me to get there the first time around, when it started to feel good, you make a lot, of, you make a lot of mistakes. You learn things as you're doing it. So throwing it away, if you're if you're able to, you have the time, and rebuilding it again, it's actually going to be much much faster than it took you to do it the first time around. Um, we had this uh, project that we were working on years ago at, uh, at Fifth Cell, and we were timing how long it would take us to make a level. The first level took us, I think, six, seven months to make with a team of four artists, um, two level designers. By the time we got to the last level, with how fast we were starting to do things, it took like a week, I think. So we went from six months for a single level to a, a week of a, of a level very, very similar in size. So. You just start learning what works, what doesn't work, and stuff like that. So don't be afraid to fail, but plan on it. Plan that you're going to maybe have to redo a lot of the work, which is why you want to stay in that kind of proxy color coding phase as long as possible while the combat designers, system designers, and all those people are kind of getting the stuff together, dialing it in as much as you can. Um, the other thing, too, is to make sure that you're challenging the player um, you, you, you have to ask these, these things to yourself when you make the level. Once you play test it every single day and stuff, it's like, did the player feel challenged? Uh, where Was it entertaining? Was the experience evolving itself? So if this is a late stage uh, level in the game, did it feel different than when you started, right? You get, a lot of games feel very similar when they start because they're teaching you the ropes. They put down like all these cues like, this is how you hit, this is how you jump, this is how you do X or Y and they'll throw a couple enemies at you just to get used to it. So that first hour as you're getting uh, your bearings should feel very, very, very different than once you're like 10 hours into the game. One of the, the my great, uh, best examples that I can think of for that would be the Dark Souls series. Um, have you guys played Dark Souls, the first one? Yeah. So when you initially get uh, thrown into the main hub of the world, you're given the option um, to go either up the stairs or over into the cemetery, and you could ch or down into where the ghosts are. So you know immediately in that first uh, hour that if you go to the skeletons, you're just going to get your ass handed to you, right? You're going to be very, very, like, persevering about it, but you know that that's maybe an area you shouldn't go. If you go to the ghost area, for example, you can't, you can't even damage them, right? So you know that you're either missing, like, some kind of power, some kind of information. A key information is missing. So naturally, the game, without even telling you, is guiding you towards the stairs. You start going to the stairs, you start being able to overcome those challenges, um, and then by the time that you circle around in the whole level design and brings you back down there, you are at a stage where you can actually take on either the ghosts or the skeletons. So you feel that you've evolved as a player. Your skill set has gotten better. You have a better understanding of the world and what the challenge is there. So you need to try to help evolve all these things as you're moving them forward. You can't keep stagnant. So letting, other, letting strangers play your level in the studio as well, people that might not necessarily play and watching them and observing them is just huge, huge, huge. And if you can do it almost every single day, like, it's invaluable information that you get. But ultimately, after you do all these uh, questions, what you're really asking yourself, is it fun? And that is what's so hard about game development, um, level design and environment in particular. Like, if it's not fun, there's no point to it, right? That's why we're making those games. That's why we're making the, these, these products, because we want them to be fun, we want them to be enjoyable. Now the question there is, if it's not fun, was it your fault? Was it a, a factor that the player is getting lost? 
Um, is it a factor of like combat? Maybe is that might be out of your hands, so that might not be on you. But are you utilizing the combat in a way in the level that it makes it fun? So maybe the combat itself is fun. You just presented it in a way or in, in a setting where the player can't really utilize the full potential of the combat system itself. So you need to try to take a look at that. And in my opinion, any decision that you make, whether it's creative or you know objective, has to be around this. Um, and one of my uh, favorite quotes recently was uh, one of the key people from Battlefield where they got started getting a lot of uh, flack for, I think it was the girl with the arm, the metal arm on Battlefield 5 that's coming out, started getting a lot of flack about it not being realistic. And their answer was just, we're always going to put fun above realism. And that is exactly, I love that because that's exactly what games are about. There are games that are very, very, uh, um, they have a, I don't know what the word is, uh, fidelity towards uh, realism and accuracy, you know, authentic. And that's okay. That There's definitely the audience for those people, but I think that a game should be fun, and so you should morph and suspend so disbelief to a certain extent with art and design at the helm of, like, helping you to suspend disbelief in order to drive that. Um, so the things to accommodate in a level to help drive a lot of these things is always plan on multiple angles of uh, approach and different player types. So give the don't string the player along in a single corridor path. Let them decide how they're going to approach a scenario. De Deus Ex is great about this stuff, like letting players stealth, letting players like just go heads on, or completely bypass encounters by using like the the HVAC system and the level and stuff like that, right? Give Present the player enough options so that they feel in control and they have authority over their session, um, but ultimately are moving the experience along because you've designed it in that way. You've just given the options and let them do it. Games that nowadays feel kind of stagnant and not as fun are games that rely heavily on like a single path, um, very obvious points where the player doesn't really have a lot of... Um, a lot of say to their experience, so definitely plan for that. Plan for people that like to be combat heavy, plan for people that like to be collectionists, so hide secrets around the, the, the level, make sure that they're traversing it, that they're you know finding all these little things that you're hiding for them. Uh, help the way and actions without being explicit, so it's a little bit of what I was saying before, like making sure that lighting and prop placement and stuff are guiding the player where you want them to go and to make it clear like you need to hack the door, you need to get to this platform and stuff like that, like just making sure that all that stuff is playing together nicely so that they know what to do but may not know how to do it. So that's part of the fun and their autonomy in their play sessions to figure that out. Um, what are we on? Okay. Uh, help evolve the experience. Um, and so this is one of my uh, favorite games of all time, Skyrim, which I'm sure a lot of you have poured hours and hours into. This uh, game for me uh, encapsulates perfectly what I'm talking about here, where a lot of the, the, the main quest itself is just okay. It, like, it moves you along, it gets the story across, uh, you experience what the game is about, but a lot of the fun in this game is actually just stumbling onto things and having that complete player authority. You come out of the cave, you can go anywhere you want, you read a book, you learn about this lore, deep lore in the world that triggers a quest that takes you over to a bar where you talk and you have a fist fight with somebody and then you wake up uh, beaten up drunk in a ship that's taking you so like that level of you just stumbling upon things is exactly what a lot of these things are are it's, it's no accident they're planning for it right they're planning for the player to go and stumble upon these things and have that sense of awe and wonder so Early prototyping is key, like we said. Gray box as much as possible, so keep things as loose and simple without a lot of detail on them until you until it feels right. It should feel just as right as the shipping game with all these elements in there without necessarily having the detail. The detail is going to help you a whole bunch. It's going to make a lot of things clearer. It's going to sell the experience, but it's not going to automatically make the game at the end of it. If, if your game and your level is not feeling quite there by the time you're in the prototyping phase, you really should reconsider. Um, there's also, uh, I'm not sure what the term is, but being able to project, like, it doesn't feel that way, but we're nowhere in the track, in the right track. We just need to, like, have these systems dialed in more. So you can move forward in that sense. It doesn't mean that it has to be 100% fun at that moment. Otherwise, like, scrap it and start over. No, like, game development is not like that. A lot of the times, things don't come together until the very end. Most of the time, 
they don't come together until the very end. But it's being able to extrapolate <laughs> and seeing that you're heading in that direction that's important. Um, implement color keys as part of the process. So kind of what I was showing with being able to tell what's a rock, what's a pathway, what's a door, what's foliage. Just all these blockers help like start selling that, um, that immersion. Um, hack the experience together. Um, this is something that I think is, is extremely important in pre-production, is being able to put together and just Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Rig, I think is the term? Um, Jerry Rig, Jerry Rig, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> or Jimmy. Uh, Jerry Rig the experience. So it doesn't have to be the perfect code, it doesn't have to be the perfect uh, design or art or anything like that. Just scrap something together that you can just toss away and feel like, yeah, that's actually starting to feel the way we want it to. So if you want to make a, a dungeon crawler, make a couple of pieces that can Lego themselves together and quickly make a level that is huge or small. You start knowing a lot of things by just being able to do this stuff like, are the levels too big? What size are we going to start trying to like nail in? Um, so you just don't start building content thinking, we need to make a four kilometer world when reality, it's just fun when it's two, two kilometers. If you go beyond that, it starts to feel kind of boring and stuff. So, being able to just put these things together, it doesn't matter if they're perfect or not, um, and keeping keeping it kind of like rough and loose early on is going to just give you a lot of flexibility moving forward. Uh, sound effects and voiceovers are a great tool, um, and they should all be in place to figure it out. So get some early effects, like get a stupid like uh, cartoony explosion in place, and some someone in the team making audio that you can hook on to the elements of your... Um, walking on surface that it's supposed to make it feel like you're gonna just suddenly collapse onto the floor, make that part of the experience. If you know that's key, put it in there. It doesn't have to be a perfect audio or anything, but just hearing those kind of cues and seeing a lot of the like temporary effects and stuff starting to play out, it's gonna be huge, huge, huge uh, to be able to take a look and see whether you're in the right direction uh, or not. Uh, and always keep perf and gameplay in mind. So as you're building these things, Play the game, see if it's running uh, smooth or not. If it's not, take a look at what might be causing it. This will help you catch things like in, if it's in the code, if it's in your level. Maybe your level has way too uh, long of a draw distance, so you're actually loading a lot more of the level that you really want. So keeping a, a, a close eye to this as you're moving on, you should not neglect this at all until the end of the game or near the game where you're actually making the art. You should try to like figure out how that's... Um, how that's all puzzling together. Sorry, what is perf uh, performance? Oh, performance. Performance. Uh, so if your game, if your game is a Twitch game, for example, uh, not the streaming service, but Twitchy, like high response, you probably want to be at sixty frames per second. So that is like probably a very key thing that you want to be driving. And any time, if you're starting to drop below that on early prototype stages, you're going to want to look at why and what challenges that it's going to start to present. Um, so that the level designer and the environment artist can start taking according uh, actions according uh, to that. Uh, so this image here is uh, from Campo Santo, the Firewatch guys. They have a very. I recommend everybody here that's interested in this in this sort of discipline and stuff to take a look at their vertical slice talk that they gave, uh, two thousand. 16, I believe, or something like that. It's, it's available on YouTube. Uh, the art lead, uh, she walks you through how they did it. So they uh, took a different approach, which I really, really love. Um, they didn't quite do the proxy uh, thing that I was talking about, keeping things very like barren and just color coding. They took an actual loop of their world and brought it almost as close to shipping quality as possible um, to see whether the gameplay worked or not and how they were going to have to start structuring the entire world together. Another tool that they utilize here, that like, this is why I put it, is you can kind of see the block, uh, the blocky uh, shapes in the background as they're trying to like just establish some kind of like interest for the player, and then you see that the paint over itself is completely different than the blocker uh, image in the top. And so, paint overs are a huge tool. As an environment artist, I rely on them so, so much, and it's the ability to give the concept artist um, and other people that might be a little bit more artistically inclined, um, at least than I am, they can go ahead and tell me, hey, this is maybe what this level should look like. Here's what you should take these shapes. Um, and that can start inform help inform both the level designer and yourself as to what assets you might have to build in order to support that. So the level designer might be able to come back and say, no, you know, we, we can't do cliffs like that because we really need to be able to see over the valley and the section. So 
you haven't started having those conversations at that point. So uh, paint overs are a huge, huge tool uh, in this early stage. So uh, your level might have multiple segments and scales within itself. I'll talk a little bit more in depth about this um, when I get to talking about a little bit of state of decay, for example. But there are you have to understand with how big your level might be. So you might have an open world uh, outdoor level that suddenly transitions into indoor areas uh, that transition into underground places and stuff like that. So understanding what the traversal mechanics are in the open world versus the interactions that you have in the interiors is extremely, extremely important um, because it's going to present a lot of different kind of challenges where you, in the open world you have a big vista, you're going to have a big open space that you can move a little bit more freely the minute you go into an interior, you're restricted. So you need to understand a lot of the, the measurements and things that you're going to have to start dealing with. Uh, it's important to maintain an aesthetic and support to the story and facilitate gameplay. Again, I'm reiterating these several times because you can't lose track of these points as you're evolving the design of the level and the look. Because you start deviating from that, you're going to just start having trouble and maybe your director or something is not going to like it. They're going to have to have you redo some of that. The more you can just keep that in mind of like, what is the player supposed to experience? What are they driving to? It's just going to make your level a lot better. Um, you may go from, this is what I was talking about, a main world into a neighborhood and into a house, right? So I'll showcase that a little bit more when I show some of the state of the case stuff. Um, environmental storytelling can be key in support of level design. So environment storytelling is something that gets confused a lot into actual lore or finding pieces in the world that give you like some sense, like a node or a uh, radio, to, uh, I'm sorry, some kind of recording from one of the NPCs or something in the world. It's not about that. It actually, you can have absolutely nothing in the world to uh, be able to tell a story from it. I'll show you guys some examples here in a minute. Um, the player's imagination is just like so much better than any technical uh, stuff that you can ever throw at them. So if you can just put the little seeds of information in place, the brain automatically is going to just start filling that in. So taking advantage of that is like just huge. So here, for example, you can tell, you can see that you presented with a house. This is a house in uh, State of the K2. Um, you take a look at the house, and at first glance, it's just a house. It's obviously State of the K2 is a uh, zombie apocalypse survivor world. So it's it's decayed. You can have you can see hints of nature starting to take over. This is not maintained. This is not a place where people currently inhabit, or if they do, you know, it's, it's that's not the priority in upkeeping the look of this place. You start noticing things like. Windows, they're boarded up, so why are they boarded up? You know, there's there some sort of danger outside. Um, you can start seeing some of the stuff here, like the, the vehicle is wrecked, so that's like just sitting there piling up trash. There's a little bit of a history going on there, and we'll break that house uh, up a little bit more here in a minute. But you can start looking at reference in the world without, you can make a story about this picture in particular here without anything telling you what happened. There's probably squatters in that house Right? It's a little bit of deteriorated house. It doesn't look brand new. Um, and they're probably cooking meth or something, and you know, <laughs> it blew up. So that's, that's what I get out of it. What you guys might have gotten out of it immediately by watching, looking at it might have been completely different. But I didn't need to put that into any kind of context or uh, writing or anything like that into the game to get you a sense of like history that's lived on into the world. So I love looking at pictures like this to see what you can do um, from a level design perspective and an environment artist uh, perspective, to just keep selling that uh, that theme and that uh, the the world being alive as much as you possibly can. Same for that one, right? So this is uh, definitely a house that is abandoned. It's been like that for a while. The the foliage around there seems to be kind of just, just dying, so it's very kind of like depressing. Um, has a sense of like just sadness around it. But you start looking at the details and like. Okay, so the windows are boarded up from the outside, so it means that there's nobody probably inside that's got boarded up from the exterior. So either there's another entrance to this place, um, or that place is completely abandoned, right? If they were boarded up from the inside, it would be telling you that there's probably somebody inside, uh, there's people living in there, and they're protecting themselves. But the sheer fact that it's boarded from the outside is shifting that storytelling um, into a completely different angle. And then... I'll be showing some of the stuff here as well uh, in a minute on Google Maps. I love Google Maps. <laughs> um, 
Google Maps has this awesome feature where you can go in time, and travel in time inside of it. And this is something that I love looking at, especially working on uh, State of Decay, was the second State of Decay is placed uh, 18 months after the zombie apocalypse uh, breaks up. And so a lot of, especially as gamers, we have this preconceived notion of hearing of a post-apocalyptic world and what that looks like. And one of the first things that comes to mind is Last of Us, for example. How many people here thought of that when I, could, I said post-apocalyptic? Probably a lot of you, right? So, so you start looking at this and you start getting a little bit of a time sense of what it would actually take uh, time-wise for something to start taking over, nature to start taking over, what this previously uh, inhabited uh, neighborhood now looks like when it's completely uninhabited. You can even see that there are houses there that don't exist anymore. So they got, got uh, torn down and stuff. And I love looking at this because it gives me ideas to give storytelling in the world without even utilizing any, any new resources, uh, any kind of like in, stepping on design's toes for anything that they might want to do. If anything, it's going to enhance that experience. I'll show you guys how to, if you don't know how to do this, uh, this kind of view I'll show you here in a minute. But now if we go back here and break this house, this is a little bit of a pulled out angle from the previous image, but if we go back to this house now, you can start seeing things based on what I talked about of this house is decayed, it's not taken care of, but there's all these fences and stuff that are not natural for a house to have and it's everyday living. So somebody put that there. Somebody started to build up uh, facilities and, and barracks and defensive uh, structures to be able to hold out this house. So as you're traversing through it, it's starting to give you an idea of what the story that might have happened around it. It might be multiple stories because there might have been a lot of survivors that came through this house and took over it. So it's starting to just sell the idea of this house was at one point a defensible area, it no longer is. Um, let's try to go in and explore and find out why. And you might start giving some hints. I, I don't have it here, but if you play the game and you go around here, actually, there's a couple of graves in the back in the back of in the backyard of the house. So it gives you an idea of like, oh, the people that lived here just they died or they got taken out, and you know somebody that cared enough for them just buried them. So they were probably close to the people that were here. So there's just this whole story that you can just stumble upon and give the player a lot more richness to the world. Um, so assembling it or going shopping, you have, you take a lot of the assets um, that you built, uh, and we use. If you go back here a little bit, we use a lot of these assets everywhere in the world. Um, we don't really have any kind of hero props or what would be considered like a one-off things. We have a couple of one-off structures, but we have the same library everywhere. It's just about how you utilize it and how we're telling a lot of different stories. We have areas that are heavily industrial themed or heavily farmland themed and stuff like that. They're all the same assets, so it's just you know taking a look at what you might be able to bring into your arsenal, and then just populating the world, telling those stories while making sure that the traversal and all that stuff is still fun. So make it pretty, and this is something I'm going to talk about a, a technique that I like to do, um, which is staying on top of the technical here. Uh, this should be good. We'll go back to the other image here in a second. Early on, like uh, we had a lot of people uh, work on these houses, and who here has played a state of the K? I'm sorry, not that many. Okay, uh, the first one, the second one, it doesn't matter which one. Um, so one of the things that you get caught up on as uh, as the artist, and you, this is where I love having that like level designer mindset a little bit, is you get caught up on making it look really good and selling it. It's like you would have outlets here, you would have like the sort of trimming on the wall here. Um, you know, just making it feel realistic. But ultimately, you, when you're making that, you have to ask yourself, what is this actually doing for the game and for the player experience? Is me being really accurate about the placement of the wall outlets um, bringing any like extra layer of depth to the player? It, unless you're actually interacting with these things and there's like a design-driven uh, purpose behind them, you're probably not. So one of the first things that nobody notices is that there's no interior doors in any of the buildings in City of Decay. Like you go in, you bust through the front door, and then there are no other doors inside that you ever interact with, and nobody catches on to that. Why? Because there's just enough. We gave we, we gave you uh, the first doorway. Your brain already processed the fact that there's a door. You're not really thinking about it. You're just moving through the world because now you're in there. You're looking for loot. You're looking for things to do in the world. You're not looking to interact with the door and just moving to the next one. You're doing that by um, just moving around, right? And we want to like remove that friction as much as possible so you're not moving through small areas and small spaces and having to slow you down in that sense. Um, 
So when it came time to stay on top of a lot of the technical stuff here, one of the things that we started to do was uh, a lot of things were placed uh, correctly, like light uh, switches in every single one of the doors in the bedrooms, um, correct light fixtures everywhere. And what I, I did an experiment where I started to take a lot of those away. And same way as the door, I left them near the entrance and near the exits um, and then removed them everywhere else from the, from the building. Nobody noticed because in your mind, you already saw them once. So your brain is already feeling the fact that there are light switches in this world. I know just by familiarity with the real world that they're just everywhere. So you're not really looking for them because they do nothing for you gameplay wise. But you already put that seed of they exist. Therefore, your brain just fills in the rest. Um, and then another thing in this one, for example, is make them make the building, make your level and stuff look as pretty as it can be. Uh, set dress it in a way that is telling that story. But then let it simmer and come back to it with a fresh eye and do an editing pass. That is something that a lot of artists like fail to do. And this is where a lot of friction between designers and artists happen is because artists are, their job is to make it look as pretty as possible and to really sell you the graphics, right? And the level designer, the designers themselves are trying to sell you the experience and have a fun uh, moment to moment. And so when those two kind of contradict themselves, uh, you start having these frictions. So in here we had this house that looked uh, really, really good. Um, there was maybe a couple of too many textures on it. So that's why they look slightly different because I did some stuff there with shaders to try to like minimize the amount of textures used. But if you can, um, sorry, let's step out here real quick. Um, you can see the green highlight there. So that's kind of what you can navigate around, right? And if you're walking around there and you have zombies coming to you, they might have a little bit of a hard time uh, just funneling through this like short area between the couches and the walls. And the couches don't have physics, they're not gonna move, they're static. They're, they're actually physically blocking you. In the second one, you can see same set dressing, you're kind of telling the same storytelling, but now you've kind of spread things out uh, to where gameplay wise, you have a very open field for combat encounters and stuff, right? Still not as ideal as if you were in the, out, in the exterior world, um, but you would now present um, a scenario where if you are encountered with a combat scenario in there, it's going to be fun. You're not going to feel like I got snagged in this collision um, and just make it like just a frustrating experience for the player. So this is, if an environment artist can think about this stuff as their set dressing, then they can already start to make their, for one, they're not going to have to de redo as much work as they uh, might have to eventually. If a level designer is thinking about the art side of it and how it's going to be set dressed, then they can already start hinting at like, hey, start putting things in the corners, leave the padding as much as possible open, don't put things near windows because in our game you jump through windows and stuff, so if you have things there, they might break uh, the interaction there. So <clears throat> think about a lot of these things, just going to, goes back to the point that I made earlier, it's gonna solve things early on. So that artistic eye for level designer, not needed, but greatly appreciated. So, then this, oh sorry, this is a, in the wrong order here. This was part of the whole like, um, discovering things naturally and stuff like that. Like Bethesda is just one of the best that, you know, does all that stuff. Um, another thing that you can do about building a lot of these things is modular building, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar, so I'm not going to get too deep into it. If you don't know about it, uh, in the question section, we can talk a little bit more about it. But modular building and keeping assets uh, reusable as much as you possibly can. Um, so let's go to gray boxing and iterating. And where are we on? We have 15 minutes. <sighs> okay. I'm going to have to skip through this a little bit faster. So just again, uh, <laughs> <laughs> fail often. Embrace failure. A lot of people are afraid of it. Uh, I've been I've been part of a, a lot of uh, teams and just processes where people are afraid of wasting work. Don't be afraid of wasting work early on. Like embrace it. Just get through as many ideas as you possibly can. It's the same as like when you're doing life drawing or sketching and stuff like that. The more you do and the, the the more you can just put yourself through it, the better it's going to be. So try things out. Don't be afraid of them um, because you're probably just one step closer to figuring out and getting it just right. Uh, so great boxing, fail fast, fail cheap. Sorry, I'm gonna go through this a lot fast because um, a lot of these are at the same points. Uh, establish stand establishing standards and setting up danger rooms. This is like huge uh, for level designers and building 3D stuff. 
being able to set up a, uh, an environment that you're starting to tell rules of like heights, uh, lengths, draw distances, what the angle of stairs might be is going to start helping inform animators, uh, combat designers, uh, environment artists, world designers. These are just rules that are going to start giving you those measurements for all the disciplines to start like working uh, syn synchro um, at the same time. Um, so that they can just start moving along because it's impossible to wait for one discipline to be done to hand it off to the next one so that they can do their work. So you all have to work together. So as much of these things that you can put into the ground and they can take a stake on them early on, the better you're going to be uh, about them. So you can block things out to even buildings and stuff. They don't need to be necessarily super detailed. And you can gray box an entire area that is really selling you the, the feel of that level. Uh, the giving purpose through mood and atmosphere, um, being able to showcase uh, where you want the players to go. If you want it to feel kind of like scary and intimate, you can kind of see that, like that Resident Evil 4 screenshot, like the, con the juxtaposition of like the Dark Souls one where you have like this beautiful environment, gorgeous lighting with just the oblique nature of what the game is and how punishing it is, right? So uh, make areas also, you can make them feel fun and inviting. Uh, feel mischievous as well, so these games do a great job at that, use, utilizing shapes, color, lighting, they all spell out fun and interest, there's not like sadness or anything like that being transmitted to you through these. Um, creating directions to follow, uh, just, you know, pathways and utilizing lighting, you can be very obvious like this one, this is a big le uh, Left 4 Dead where you're directly guiding the player where to go, even though there might be some interest to the left or right, you ultimately know you need to go down that hallway. Um, Left 4 Dead 1 is one of my best examples for this. They guide the players through light and most people don't catch on to it, um, which is why all their levels are at nighttime. Left 4 Dead 2, uh, on the other hand, I'm not as big of a fan of, even though I enjoy it a lot, because it feels confusing to traverse that those levels, in my opinion, because they chose daylight. And even though they have a lot of things in place to cue you as to where to go, it's not as direct as Left 4 Dead 1, which was nighttime. And it was just part of that theme and the immersiveness that was telling you where to go without being, you know, having a big arrow in the world telling you. And World of Warcraft has the same thing where they have the golden paths uh, for you to follow. So you know if you stick to the golden path, you're going to get to town A, to town B. You're going to find your way. You can venture off of it, but that you already know. You enforce a player by telling him you better veer off the path. Then you're going to encounter danger, and that's okay because the player knows that. So if they decide to do that, that was their decision. They're deciding to go into this thing. I want to talk a little bit about hybrid itself. Um, it was, I can't read that well. <laughs> um, the key pillars for hybrid, which was an XBLA game, was realistic looking, really uh, detailed and post-apocalyptic. Uh, it was rail movement. Player did not have freedom of movement. Special traversal uh, to unexpected areas, so that meant that you could go into, you moved cover to cover, and you could move to cover that was on the ceiling, that was upside down, or on the walls. Um, so being able to like take all those directives and put them into a visual language was definitely a challenge. Uh, this is some of the early photos of the original art look that we went with. We're trying to emulate something more along the lines of the Gears of War. Um, you can kind of see how gritty, noisy, um, you know, realistic kind of setting these are. But when you're looking at them, you don't see a lot of stuff that I was talking about earlier, like no clear path, no clear distinction of what is gameplay area, what isn't. Um, so we quickly had to start scrapping things because we also had um, directives of design of open ceilings because things could just fall on you, the, the robots would come down, that's how they would spawn. So you couldn't be inside of a building uh, with a rooftop because you couldn't spawn the robots when you called them, so you had to somehow excuse visually that this building has no ceilings. Um, and then going through all the processes that I outlined earlier, I'm going to show you the videos of how it went from like gray boxing to a little bit of an art edit to final art. So hopefully this uh, works. So it's over here. This. So. This is like a, what a gray box would be. Um, we had a level designer, Adam Fenderson, I believe, was a designer for this, or if not, Dan, Daniel Cho. 
Um, while they were working on the specific gray box of this level, we were working on the theme of it, right? For the stuff that wouldn't really impact this, we were working on the sky box itself, trying to see like, are we gonna sell this? This was the biggest level that we made in terms of like the scale that we were trying to sell. Um, so it's very important to try to see if we could even realistically afford the cost of that sky box that we were making because this was a 60 frames per second game. So you could just see the nature of the gray box itself, you know, where the covers are and stuff like that. And the way the camera's moving is definitely not representative of how the player moved, it's just showcasing um, that part of it. So we move see from there, because um, um, And then I'll skip that one because it's very similar, but here you'll see uh, what it ended up looking at, like Arden. So this is after working with design and environment art and stuff and making it uh, you know, function the way it needed to while respecting all those line of sides, all those blocking areas that we needed to, and then having the, the skybox itself run at a decent uh, cost for us to be able to afford it. And you can see, if you saw there was like a little bit of like a overhang on that cover beforehand, but something that we had to implement later on that wasn't in the gray box because players were being able to snipe when they were flying from cover to cover. They were able to snipe people that were hiding behind cover really easily. So we had to figure out a way to like give those players still like an advantage when they were in cover because you're supposed to be uh, safe when you're in cover. So it just gives you an idea of where it can start and where it can go if you're you know all talking together at the same time. Um, okay, that thanks. Uh, we'll skip this. I was afraid I wasn't going to have enough content for the time. And, uh, <laughs> um, so again, it's important to keep things as loose as, as well for as long as possible. From the art side, I can tell you that it's, I don't want to like diminish the, that it's not hard to make art, but it's the easiest no, uh, thing that we can achieve. Not having the design and it feeling fun and stuff like that can just throw a big wrench into it. So don't feel that if you don't see the art advancing as much as you would like it in your level, it means that you're falling behind and that it's not going to be there. If you have competent artists and you know passionate people in the in your team, they're gonna definitely get there. It's more it's more important to figure out the level design and the fun factor than it is to figure out the visuals themselves. They're important, but they I've never not seen art deliver um, stuff where it's like if the design's not there, it can really really mess things up. Uh, so with this, just keep in mind that function should be the driver of everything you do of the theme, um, and it says. Should, and the theme should be a close second without ever hurting the parent function, which is just, you know, interactivity and clearance. So that, all that stuff is great. What about open world stuff? This is great for, like, linear experiences and, you know, moving through hallways or just levels that are self-contained. But when it comes to world, open world stuff, it's a different beast. Like, how do you design around a game that is kind of systematic, pretty much systematic at its core, and you, have, you know that the player has almost complete autonomy of what they do. Um, so it's pretty much a lot of the same points we have talked about before with just a couple new ones. Use landmarks for orientation. Make sure that the player always knows where they're located. Try to establish traversal time beats so that the player's always encountering something interesting to do, a house to loot, uh, a little bit of a side storytelling thing. Like They're always finding things to do in the world at a certain amount of interval, and that can uh, vary a lot depending on your game and the size of what you're doing. So establish golden paths so that the player knows easily what the main path is and how it might take them back to their safe area, their home base. And reward the player behavior. I want to use the word reward here because it's it has a much different connotation than punishing. If a player starts venturing out into an area that's not necessarily meant to be explored, like don't immediately cut them off from being able to go there but maybe don't put as much interest. So put foliage, put rocks, make it still feel believable. But eventually, if you've done the time beat, uh, the traversal time beat correctly, they'll look, quickly learn that there's nothing to find here, and they'll naturally turn around and you know go back to the main path of where things are, where things are like piquing their interest. You need to have a fail safe so that players that want to just break the system, like you can hold them back, you can put some invisible walls, and you know art them up a little bit so that they feel that it's a natural boundary. But you just want to reward them by giving them things to do. So you're you know, just upkeeping that traversal time beat so that they're always feeling that there's something to engage with. Um, and the minute that they just feel they've gone too long without any kind of engagement, 
then they naturally know they're in the wrong path. Five minute warning. Five minute warning. Five minute, okay. Um, so it's not that different, just you have to keep a lot of those things in mind. Uh, I can talk a lot about this stuff here uh, at the questions. Um, the agency itself is a lot, pretty old project, but it follows a lot of those things that I was talking about. DC Universe is one that I jumped in late on, just helped finish, but it has a lot of the same uh, things where just big rooms uh, so that combat could take place, that's the biggest uh, driving factor with them. And then some of the open world stuff here, you can see how a gray box itself is taking place while the world itself is kind of being designed. So these, all these different processes and disciplines and tips can kind of go in tandem. They don't have to be exclusive in a linear fashion. Somebody can be designing like a specific encounter on a base here while the rest of the world is kind of getting figured out and those landmarks are being established. Um, and then you can take like things like the artist will work on the world machine here um, and mask things out where you know there's heavy gameplay areas. The downside to that is that any, any change you do, even if it's uh, slight in the minimum, you can kind of see here, height itself is now changing. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, every project is gonna be a lot different. And then obviously it gets very, very complicated um, graph-wise and being able to maintain it. So a small change could just mean lots of time going back and make sure that nothing else cascaded. Um, so let's just jump really quickly into the state of the case. Um, three open world environments, open-ended sessions, every player experience is unique, system design at its core, and vehicles to top it off. So from a level design environment artist uh, perspective, we do things like establish a little bit of a town, put some of the buildings in here. You can kind of see, you don't know how to enter that building. There's nothing telling you what to do in that building other than the building exists. And with a little bit of arting and uh, level design stuff here, you're already telling the player there's a path. Even though they can still enter it as if there was nothing there, there's already all these visual cues and some soft uh, boundaries that prevent the player from just venturing out too far or that just inform them as to how they might want to approach that building. Same here for an area that doesn't have any structure, uh, any structures, sorry. Uh, just going back and forth with, you can traverse through this versus now that you've kind of cleared out some paths and you can you know, show the dirt, um, uh, block some of the line of sight for trees and everything, the player knows where to go. So this is uh, where a lot of that stuff is. And, and as you're exploring, you come across areas like this where it just starts to pique your interest. You can start seeing multiple layers of buildings even behind that are just going to make you want to keep moving forward and exploring. Um, so here's an example of one of the maps that I worked on. This is uh, Cascade Hills, I think is the official name. And so let, I want to break it down into establishing the golden path. So these are the drivable parts of the map. And you can kind of see how it all kind of loops itself back around. You give the player a couple options here and there to branch out and take a different direction or a different approach when traversing. But anytime the player gets back into the main road, they know that eventually it'll bring them back to where they were. Um, if they're not even that familiar with the map or decide not to use the mini map or something like that. And then we give a couple of secondary arteries, which are separate traversal areas that they can still drive on uh, without you know, destroying the vehicle or anything, but they're not necessarily the main pass, and they'll take them to a specific building, to a specific point of interest and stuff, uh, and they, they, they just make their way back into the golden room. Um, and then some boundaries that we don't want them to cross so that they don't go from here to there as easily. We just make like a big mountain there so that they can't just go up on it. We force you to go all the way around. And you can kind of see how nicely this just kind of loops itself around, which is very different than how a city or an actual town would be laid on, which is almost like on a grid and branching out from the main street. Um, you can see the same kind of approach to all the other maps, how they uh, loop around. And then the starting area where you start the game, we kind of like this design a couple of small sections where you would call the newbie areas, so you can get familiar with the mechanics of the game, you can loot everything, you can go around and explore, and then you can see here, you leave that, that's pointing to this side, where, which is in red, and it's, you can get a hint, it might be a little bit hard to see, but you can get a hint of some houses and stuff, so it's immediately a path forward, a couple of hints of things that you might be interested in as a player, and that's stuff that you can just do immediately the minute you start the game. And then on the opposite side, if you go out the other door, there's a little bit more of an advanced area, right? Once you've got your bearings in, or you just want to go dive in straight into it, you can just go straight into this. It's a lot more open, a lot more things to find. 
Um, and we just make sure that every time you exit a base in the game, you always see something that piques your interest and you're like thrown towards um, without the player really even knowing. So you have to kind of be able to see. And this is a shot from the newbie area as you're returning. So if you go to the newbie area and loot and bring stuff back as you're heading back to the home base, which is that right there, you can kind of start seeing things off in the distance that might, might pique your interest and then you just start decide to go that way. So we're always trying to like breadcrumb you around so that you're always finding something to do. I'm not going to have time to show this, so after we're done here, if people are interested, I'll show it. Again, just different path options, um, even though the player can climb, opening up areas and gates so that they don't feel like they're stopped, they can just easily traverse. Um, and then just storytelling in itself, which also serves uh, slowing of the player. We use a lot of the wrecks for the cars, for example, to help you slow you down a little bit so we can start loading some of the next areas coming up and stuff so you just bolt your way through the road. Um, but it helps. And then the VR, I'm not going to have time to go over that stuff, so feel free to talk to me about it. Um, but it wasn't so much, there wasn't a lot to talk about there in this anyway. So, just to recap, establish standards as quick as possible. Mixing disciplines earlier is not going to hurt you, it's going to benefit you. Gray box and establish uh, cornerstones without polishing, so those main pillars. Test and test and test until you get it. Look at the player's behavior while designing and catch your errors early. Don't be afraid to start over. And content is expensive, uh, so use it, but keep it lean. Try to keep it to a, just a dozen of assets or something that you're using in the world as much as possible. And try to do with that um, and only bring in unique stuff when you really, really need to. Uh, and expect changes and adjustments all the way to the end. It's going to change, which is why working in this manner is going to just make your life a lot easier. So a little bit of credit of things that I... Uh, used for this research or things that I've like looked at in the past uh, that helped me a lot. Um, there's all the people credited here. Some people are probably present in this audience. Um, and anyway, questions, and this is the where you can find me.